uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, and last week we left off at uh, verse 3, so today we'll pick up at uh, verse 4, and uh, I thought Connor was going to read part of my text for today, but he didn't. Anyway, we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4, we'll read these, one, these verses one at a time, and uh, Paul is writing, he says, and we have confidence and the Lord touching or concerning you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. Now, the best way in the world that you can determine the future of anything, I don't care what it is, whether it be a person, whether it be an organization, uh, whether it be some me mechanical piece of device, is to look at that thing's past track record. And that's exactly the way the world of finance works. That's the way the world of insurance works. For example, uh, if you take a bank, for example, and they uh, are looking at a loan application for an individual, they're going to look to see if you're a late payer, if you're a slow payer, if you're a no payer, <laughs> if they have to call you every month and remind you that you have an outstanding bill that's three months in arrears. And if they find that out on you, they're going to think to themselves that you're going to do exactly the same thing into the future that you have done in the past. And it's just that way with the insurance, too, uh, because there is not only a credit score, there's also an insurance score that people don't know about. And uh, insurance score kind of operates like this. They look at your MVR, wh what tickets you have on your record, what accidents you have on your record, are you a late payer and paying your premiums? Uh, do you like, are you claims happy? Do you turn in claims uh, uh, separate and apart from the MVR? Uh, if you do, then they expect that you're going to continue that on into the future. But here we're talking about the church, aren't we? And Paul says that we, he's speaking of himself and Timothy and Silvanus, all the apostles and those who work with them, we do have confidence that you will continue to do just exactly what you have been doing thus far. And what they have been doing thus far has actually been a very good job of being faithful to the Lord. In spite of the fact that they have had all this resistance from Satan and those who belong to him, they're at Thessalonica of their own countrymen. I mean, we're not talking about people coming in from out of town and, and bringing persecution or terrorism on the church. We're talking about the people that they have known, they've grown up with, they've they, they live beside them, possibly. They work with them, and they're getting all this resistance from them. But Paul says, I have confidence that what we're, what we're telling you, you're going to continue to do this into the future. So the same thing can be said about the good as well as the bad, can it? And I have to ask myself a question. Can this apply to me? Can this apply to the church? Does it apply to you? There's not much point in us studying these verses if we don't try to make some kind of an application. Can it be said of us that they would have confidence in us into the future, us doing the same thing that we're doing, whatever that might be? Are we doing nothing? Can somebody have confidence to say to us or about us, well, he's not doing anything. We'll expect him in the future to be doing nothing into the future as well. But if we're working for the Lord, if we're faithful to the Lord, if we're trying to do his will, if we're trying to learn more, trying to expand our knowledge of his word, of his gospel, and see the will and the wisdom of God in his word and how it applies to us, how it applies to our society for the better, how it applies to the church for its edification, then someone can say of us, like he said of the church at Thessalonica, that we have confidence concerning you that you're going to continue to grow as you have been. In Galatians chapter 5, we're told not to grow weary of well-doing because in the future we will reap our reward if we faint not. And this is indirectly what Paul is referring to here. We do have to be confident. We do have to be confident in the Lord so that others can be confident in us. But what I'm saying is our hope is not here. So what we do for the Lord we're not doing it for the here and now. We're doing it to please him because that's what he wants us to do. But we don't wait on any kind of reward right here, right now in this world. 
That's not what we're doing it for. We're doing it for the Lord and for the eternity that is to come. Spending it with him, the Father and the Son. Now, as far as this, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's look at verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. As far as this patient waiting for Christ is concerned, I can think of no better scripture that describes this patience that a Christian is supposed to have about something that happens into the future and that between now and then, between our, our unity with Christ when he comes back again and where we stand right now in the kingdom here on this earth in the flesh, then to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you look at the at, uh, verses 1 through 5, I'll read that. And we're not going to study this as a, as a study, but just to go over it very generally and as, a, as a skeleton here to apply to verse 5 of our text in 2 Thessalonians. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and looking at verses 1 through 5, he writes to the church at Corinth, and he says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tabernacle, as speaking of our body, were dissolved or dies, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, being that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnest of his Holy Spirit. So he speaks of this tabernacle that we're in. Now you know a tabernacle is a, a building that is temporary, and it is a building that's temporary because it moves. You can, you can dismantle it and you can move it. That's why it's called a tabernacle or a tent. That's a very basic word to describe for it, but it is a temporary a structure, and it's pointing to this mortal body that we live in because God has redeemed us through Christ, and we're not going to stay in this mortal flesh forever. It is just a temporary dwelling of the Holy Spirit, just like this tabernacle was a temporary place of worship under the Old Testament, and, and the whole Old Testament itself was just temporary as well. But we... You and I, as the Christians uh, of this generation and since the day of Pentecost forward, we're looking forward to an eternal place, some place which has a foundation made by God, made without hands, that is eternal in the heavens. And he said there in 2 Corinthians that we groan for this. We, we long for this. That's what we want. You know, and, and I was thinking as I was preparing verse 5 here and as, as I was reading uh, Second Corinthians 5, some that came to me just like that. Over the years, I've talked to older Christians and, and just in the normal conversation thing, I don't know of anybody, anytime, anywhere, that their faith is not solid in the Lord, that they want to be here forever. Nobody wants to be here in, on this world forever. They want to be with the Lord, don't they? They want to be where Christ is. They want to be where the Father and the Son are. Uh, they have no desire to live here indefinitely. I don't want to live here indefinitely. I mean, even if I had the remedy, and, and I heard a rumor once that uh, this king of Tyrus, and I don't know if you've heard it or not, uh, and I don't know, even know if it's true, but it's a rumor that I heard that, that this king of Tyrus and Solomon discovered the secret to eternal life in their, <laughs> in their day. And I said, well, they obviously didn't make very good use of it because they're, they're dead. <laughs> but let's just say that that were true. Who would want it? Who would want it? I mean, who wants to live in this body forever? You know, you see what I'm saying? We want an eternal body. We want a body like Christ has. We don't want this body in the flesh where we uh, are in pain, we have injuries, we get old, we get tired. We don't, we don't want this forever. But we don't want to go through the pains of death to get to where we're going. And that's what the point of what Paul was saying there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I don't know of anybody that really wants, saved or not, that really wants to go through the portal of death. And the reason why the Christian does not want to go through, the, through death 
is because he knows within himself that he by himself cannot stand in judgment and be judged with the with the severity of with Christ's judgments undiluted without an advocate by his side. He knows he can't do that because he knows he's not saved by his good works. And, of course, the, the lost person, he has no chance of being saved. As Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where does the sinner and the ungodly appear? What chance do they have? They don't. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here, the Christian he wants, as Paul says very clearly here, he wants this eternal life, but he just wants God to come down on him and just clothe him with it without us having to go through death. But we have to remind ourselves, if Christ went through death, we're not any better than he is. And we have to go through it too. Our point is we just got to be ready. Christ was always ready. Christ knew what was going to happen to him because he set aside his immortality and he, he, got, he brought it back again. But, uh, of course, we have to have this mortality in Christ. We don't have this power in and of ourselves. Our power lies with him. Therefore, we have to adopt, as Paul is saying here, this attitude of patience. Patience and love are things that you cannot command to somebody and drag it out of somebody. It is something that they themselves have to develop on their own. If they don't have love, a love for God is, of course, what we're speaking of here. And if they don't have a patience for God's will in their life, then you can't make them have it. But you can tell them that they need to have it so that they can develop that in their own life, so that they can grow into that, and so that they can be the people of God, relying on his will, relying on his wisdom, and, and divorcing themselves from the world completely. Because love and patience are something... I cannot dictate to somebody else. I have a hard enough time with it myself, but I can't, I can't order that through anyone else. Now, let's back up a, a bit here in verse 5, and let's look at this love of God because he says that the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. And, of course, this is something we're always growing in. This is something we're always having better eyes to see as we mature in Christ, to see God's action in our life and to see his care for us in our life, both spiritually and in this world as well. But I would like to look at the love of God today, right now, and I would like to look at it a little bit differently than what Paul is talking about here, just for the sake of uh, making a clarification. I would like to look at the how of the love of God, not the why, because in my lifetime I've never run across any man who can explain to me why that God loves us. <laughs> I can't explain it, and neither can anybody else. But maybe, maybe by what I'm fixing to say here, I can explain to you in a little bit of a glimmer of the how that God can love us. And I want to put this into a perspective that I think that we can kind of understand because I would like to talk about the earth and the universe and then talk about the atheists and what they think. Now, if you think about the earth and you think about the scale of the earth in relation to the whole universe that we know of, because the most powerful telescopes that we have, whether it be the Hubble or the James Webb or whatever, as far as they can see, they're picking up new stars all the time. And they're looking at a section of the sky that they think is completely dark. And they turn that telescope there, and it's just full of light. There's stars, and there's evidence of planets there. Uh, so the Earth, if you take the Earth and put it on a scale, and let's just say that you scale the Earth down to a grain of sand, and you put that grain of sand in the Pacific Ocean, that's still not a true representation of Earth in this universe, is it? Because we know, if science is correct, that there are planets and stars out there millions of light years away. And, of course, light, I think, travels at, a, what is, 186,000 miles per second. So multiply that by years, and you've got your distances. As far as the atheist is concerned... The reason why they have such a trouble 
And I would like to address these very quickly and get on to the third one because this is, this is what I'm trying to explain on the how of the love of God. The atheist, he does not believe in God because God cannot be quantified by him in some test tube or under some instrument or by some measuring device or some any kind of experiment and all. You know, God cannot be found by him. He's not something physical. So they don't believe in God. They believe that God has to be like us. But, of course, that's not the way it is. The second thing is that if God were uh, the good God that we say that he is, then why would he allow these evil things to occur? You know, all this murder, all this death, all this suffering. But we have to understand God didn't bring that into the world. Mankind brought that into the world. We did that in the garden as a whole, as a race. We did that. So, but from the beginning of time, God's message to man has always been the message of repentance. Even through the, the message of Christ, it is the message of repentance. And that tells us that God wants us to get out of sin, to get away from it, to be apart from it, so that we don't have to suffer, not only here, but also in eternity. So for someone to say that uh, God allows uh, this sin to happen because he's not, he's not present in the first place, well, that's, that's not according to knowledge because we do know that God does not want sin in our life. He does not want these things. God never created man to suffer. God never created man to die. God never created man to be in sorrow. He created man to be like himself, and it was only sin that caused these things to be the way that they are. But the third thing here that I'd like to concentrate on for just a minute here, and that is what I said at the first about the earth being a grain of sand in the Pacific Ocean. The atheist looks at this earth, and they understand like you and I do just how small the earth is. It's not even a speck in all of the universe. And they say, how in the world could God, if he exists, pay attention to this little planet right here, and we're not even a speck on a speck. How could he love anybody here if that's so, if he exists? And if this earth is the size that it is compared to the rest of the universe, and it is, then how is it possible that God could love us? Well, I want to put this into an example for you that maybe you can understand it and we'll understand how, how this love of God might work, at least a glimmer of it. For those of you men who are married to this woman of your, your soulmate, let's just say that she's here on this earth with you, but you get into a spaceship that has this super capability and you fly to this planet that is beyond the reach of the Hubble and the James Webb telescope to a planet that can't even be seen. And let's say it's 10 million light years away and you get there by this time tomorrow. That place that you're at by yourself, away from your soulmate, do you love her any less there than you did here? You don't, do you? Why not? Have you ever asked yourself the question, why not? Why would you not love her less that far away? Now, I know, I'm not trying to say anything personal, but Russ, his wife has left him through the avenue of death, but he loves her just as much now as he did when he was with her. Why? How, how is that possible? How is that possible if she's not here? Think about that. So the answer to this question is to ask a question first. What came first, the earth or love? Love came first. All right, where did love come from? It come from God. And who is God? He is eternal. So that tells me that love is not in the physical realm. 
Love is in a realm all by itself in the eternity. It has nothing, it has no bearing on the physical whatsoever. That's why that you can get into that spaceship and you can fly tens of millions of light years away from here. And that does not change your love for your soulmate at all. Because the physical things of this world have no bearing on that. And we studied in class in, in, in a completely different subject than what we're studying now. But someone who lives in the realm of eternity like God does, time and space and mass and distance and all these physical parameters have absolutely no bearing on somebody like that whatsoever. Nothing. Because love and righteousness are eternal and they come from God. So therefore, they transcend all these physical things. They will be around when all these physical things come to an end. And when Christ comes back again, we know that all these physical things are going to come to an end because, as the psalmist says, you'll fold it up just like a garment, just like an old garment. You'll fold it up and put it away. But those things which are steadfast, those things which are, which are eternal, are going to remain forever and ever, and one of those is love. So therefore... For the atheist to say, how can God love us when we are a speck on a speck? He doesn't understand what love is. That love is outside the physical. And so these physical things that we have around us have no bearing on the love of God to us at all. And that's how that God, that's how, not why, but that's how that God can love us as his creation in spite of the fact that the universe is tens of millions of light years across, and even more. So I hope I didn't muddy the waters on that some, but uh, anyway, I thought I would try to bring that point out to you because that, that, that is an invalid argument that I hear from the, from the atheist crowd uh, surfing around on the web and on the TV and so forth. How can God love us? You know, we're just a speck on a speck and this and that and the other, so... Maybe that'll give you some ammunition. Maybe give you some understanding if you don't ever get involved in an argument with somebody like that. <laughs> I hope you don't. <laughs> It's like uh, Romans tells us, everybody knows they have to admit within themselves that God does exist. Now, over time, excuse me, as we all can read about in the First Timothy, I think, chapter 3, over time, as we resist God, as we fight against God, our soul, our, our conscience becomes hardened to that, and we turn that off. But everybody is born with this innate understanding that God does exist, because as you're saying indirectly, even even the atheist knows right from wrong. I mean, he knows to go uh, wrong to go out and take somebody's life or to steal, to stick a gun in somebody's face and take what they got or a knife or whatever. Uh, wh where, does that, where does that come from? Does that come from Congress? I don't think so. It comes from God, and it's always been around. It's, it's always been that way. People have always known that. Okay, well, let's look at verses 6 through 10. Now, in English class, a class which I loathed with a passion when I was in school, <laughs> but at least I, I understand that from 6 through 10, this is another paragraph. And as you recall, in, uh, in that class, a sentence is a thought. A paragraph is a complete thought. It is also a change of subjects. And so what we have here is a change of subjects. We're not talking here about uh, what we've talked about in the first five verses here. We're talking about a completely different subject in verses 6 through 10. So let's just read the whole thing. And now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the traditions which he received of us. 
For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did any man, neither do we eat any man's bread for naught, but we wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might be charge that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, let me clarify a word here that, is, that has a very bad connotation today in the church, and that's this word traditions. We don't have traditions, but what Paul is speaking of here, and I think I might have mentioned this last week or at least the week before. If you look back at verse 15 of the prior chapter, he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether they by word or by epistle. So this traditions that he's talking about is exactly what we understand today as oral teaching. So, and I pointed out at that time, just for the sake of you who may not have been here, that before the Old Testament, before God gave Moses these tablets written on stone, that's the way people were taught from generation to generation. It was handed down by word of mouth from one generation to another. That's how people, that's how Seth taught, that's how Enoch taught, that's how Noah taught, uh, that's how all these other men, Noah, or not, well, yeah, Noah and uh, and Abraham and all these men taught the next generation. It was by word of mouth. There was not anything written down. By word of mouth, they instructed their children, and their children instructed their children on the fear of God and what to do. As these men came to Thessalonica, they didn't have this book like you and I have the privilege of having today. Now, they did have the privilege of the apostles who were firsthand witnesses. That, that's an advantage that we don't have. And the book of the New Testament was in the process of being written. But what they had to do was that they had to tell them face-to-face, -face, by word of mouth, what the gospel of Christ was all about. And that's all they could do because they didn't have copy machines. They didn't have all these other things that we have today to make the word of God so readily available. They had to hear it, and they had to remember it, and they had to do it. So when we speak of traditions in this sense, we're not talking about somebody just going through the motions of doing something just to be doing it. That, that is never in the New Testament, never. When, it, when the New Testament speaks about traditions, it is speaking only about oral teaching, person to person, word of mouth, uh, the gospel of Christ. Now, in case there is any doubt as to whom these uh, commandments uh, originate, the apostle spells it out. It is Christ himself. Look at verse 6. Now, we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it begins to say in the next, you know, three or four verses here about what the Lord himself is telling them. Not what they think, not what they've decided and committed, but what God himself has directed us to do with our life. And he is talking, I will say this, we're not going to get through this, but he is talking to the men. He's not talking to the woman here. From verses 6 through 10, he's talking to the man. That's his job to go out and to earn a living for the family that he has procreated. It's his job to provide for the wife that he's come in union with. That's not her responsibility to earn a living. That's his job. And... Uh, we don't have the time to get in that today, but from Titus, from all the examples that we have in the Old Testament, and I will say this, I had no intention of saying this, but this is the destruction of the family. As God is my witness, it is the destruction of the family. When we send the woman out to, in the, to be a man, now think of this, men. We send our wives out to do a job eight hours of the day. We want her to be a man earning a living. We want her to come home, turn that off, and be a woman from, say, 5 to 10 or whatever, go to sleep and then turn around and do it all over again. What if somebody, what if your wife, what if society, men, wanted you from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock to act like a woman and then come home and turn that off and turn on being a man? What would you think of that? Our society is destroyed 
as Psalms, I think it's Psalms 108, if the foundation be destroyed, what are the righteous to do? There's no way that Brett is going to plumb a building that don't have a foundation. He's going to walk on the job site and say, well, this building is built on dirt. It's going to build on sand. I'm going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste my time and my effort, my manpower, my money to plumb this building. It's not going to stand. No matter how much money he sinks into it, it's not going to stand. So if we destroy the foundations of society, how can we possibly build on anything for God, for good? It can't be done. But it is the man's responsibility for his family. It's not someone else's responsibility. And, th and this is really the point that Paul is making here in verses 6 through 10. It's not Aaron's responsibility to provide for me in my life. God has given me a mind, however small it may be, <laughs> and two hands and two feet. I've got to do something to provide for myself. I can't throw that off onto somebody else. I have a responsibility as a man to provide for myself and those who are around me. And, and it's even for my mother, as she ages, it may get to the point where she can't do anything. I still can't throw that off onto somebody else. I have to take care of that. That's my responsibility as a man. That's, that's what God expects of me. If I want to throw that off onto somebody else, what am I really doing? I'm shirking my responsibilities as a man, as a Christian. And not only that, but I'm stealing, aren't I? I'm taking something that don't belong to me. I'm taking somebody else's hard work, somebody else's money, and I'm using that for myself while I do nothing. I'm stealing. Someone may say, well, it's easy for you to say that. And, uh, you know, I've got this, I've got that, and do this or do that. L l turn with me back to John chapter 5, the gospel of John chapter 5. I want to tell you something here about work. There's something that all of us can do. Now, I don't know what it is for all of you, but there's something that all of us can do. And this just goes to show the ethic of God Almighty himself. Look at verse 17. Now, this is Jesus after he just got through healing somebody on the Sabbath day. And how does he answer to these Jews? They all, oh, you, you healed on the Sabbath day. You broke the Sabbath. Jesus said, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. That is to say, my father's always working. He never ceases working. In every place that I go, and I don't care where it is, what town, there's signs out in the yard of every business now hiring. And I'm not just talking about seven twenty-five an hour. I'm talking about $16 an hour to 22 hours an hour starting out. There is something that somebody can do. And this, uh, this really gets into me because in, in my job, I see this all the time. I see these young white men. I say young, anybody under 45. And they're already on disability, but they go hunting, they go fishing, they got at least one car, they're always keeping the roads hot, they, they can afford their beer, they can afford their cigarettes, uh, for some reason they can't afford soap and water, but they can afford these other things, and they do whatever they want to do for nothing. They get an income every month. They get free health insurance, no deductible or low deductible, no copay or low copay. They get a food allowance. They get a housing allowance. Who pays for that? That's right. He's having to provide his own living and somebody else's. This is the communist system. That's the way that works. You reward the slothful and you penalize the industrious so that everybody is equally poor. And we tell me about it, because you show me somebody who has a household income of $80,000, and I'll show you somebody's just getting by. Really, I'm serious. Well, what brought that about? The destruction of the family, the lack of morals, the lack of a work ethic in the men, to allow people like this to take office. The church is weak. We need to 
we need to address ourselves first, then we need to address our family, we need to address the church, and then maybe we can make some headway. I'll stop right here. I didn't get done, but I'll stop right here because it's 20 to almost. Any questions or any comments today's lesson? Well, thank you for your attention. We'll try to finish up with this chapter next week. Appreciate you all. To God be the glory.